Thank you, Astrid. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, good evening and welcome, everybody. And it's lovely to welcome back Paul Correa of Fiduciary Wealth Management over there in Gibraltar this evening. How are you, Paul? Absolutely fine. And you? Looking yes, forward to tonight. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you're rearing to go. I mean, we are going to be looking at financial planning for British expats. We will do, I have to say, my favourite bit, um, which is the investment ideas, tips and predictions. Um, but first, you wanted to address, you're coming out of your corner fighting, um, because you wanted to address a comment that came up before um, to, from the world of economics and economic theory. Uh, and you're, you're, you're a ground level guy, aren't you? And I think you wanted to respond to this uh, issue that came up previously. Uh, absolutely. Come, come out fighting, have, having watched Dylan White in Gibraltar regain his, 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 his crown, um, or, or at least he's now a contender. I've been inspired by him. No, I, I think it, it merits a response. And, and I think you forwarded a, 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 um, a message from one of the listeners to either a radio show or a webinar. I'm not quite sure, yeah. but a, a lady by the name of Kate Thank Gimblet, uh, and apparently she's an economist. Um, can I just read out the question so I can then address the issues that were raised? Yeah. I mean, uh, this was the message that was conveyed to you, Carl. The idea that quantitative easing necessarily creates problems down the road is not consistent with the available evidence. Economist Dr. Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, explains that the government is not an issue of its own currency and never has to pay back the entirety of its debt. So the government doesn't have to tax all that money back. The concern is inflation and that can, it, and that can be mitigated by strengthening the real economy to ensure the sufficient goods and services produced so no inflation so inflation doesn't get out of hand please consider how having someone on your show in the future how understands modern yeah, monetary theory who understands modern monetary theory so that was a challenge to you fine and which you, i'm yeah. i'm happy i'm happy to take that challenge on yes the challenge of uh, whether you understood or not modern mo monetary theory exactly uh, and i think it's bank policy so please yeah let, let's start with that tonight it, it is much more complex but than that but look i have an opinion piece here a finance opinion piece dated 30th of march which is called the false promise of modern monetary theory um, and they quite rightly say, and I share that view, um, they say, um, let me see. Ba, 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 ba. It's probably quite a big uh, tome oh. you're looking at there, isn't it? It says, uh, for those unaccustomed with MMT, in essence, it states that the US government can print and spend money limitlessly, which is what Kate is saying. Deficits don't matter. Neither does the national debt. MMT has some high profile adherents like Senator Bernie Saunders and Republican Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, many, many books have been written on MMT and most famously the deficit myth, modern monetary theory and the birth of the people's economy by Stephanie Kelton. So actually the same author yes. that Kate is, is referring to. However, MMT advocate, uh, advocates claim that they have the secret recipe to avoid the pitfalls of currency debasement and mountains of debt. Um, and basically what they say is that countries can simply keep, keep on printing money. Mm. Um, so the, the, the theory is that the debt is simply the money the government puts into the economy and doesn't tax again. And, you know, the, the, the writer of this opinion, opinion piece says this is ludicrous. Government deficit, deficit spending is not an economic boom. It is a hindrance to economic growth that impoverishes future generations. And, and I will address it in my own words. Furthermore, despite what MMT supporters claim, printing huge amounts of money will cause inflation. And they go on to say... You know, it ignores the dark history of debt monetization leading to hyperinflation. MMT is far from groundbreaking, let alone modern. It is simply a failed idea that has been tried many times and has led to economic destruction in every case. Although MMT proponents would like us to believe that it is a contemporary economic breakthrough, don't believe the hype. 
common sense refutes MMT on its face. And look, MM, MMT is like saying, you know what, guys, you know, use your credit cards to the hilt, borrow as much money as you like. Yes. But, you know, that doesn't, you know, it's fine. Anyway, so, Paul, look. Will you address it? In, well, I know you're going to do this now, but before you do address it in your own way, if I can sort of crystallize that, this is, this is a concern for, for us everyday people, uh, men and women who are thinking, hold on a minute, they're continuing to print money. Um, and at some point, this has to be paid back. And, and how will, will that end in a crash? Um, and how will people, regular people, taxpayers, feel the heat? That, that's the essential issue here that I think people struggle with. And you're about to uh, sort of unveil your view on it. Absolutely. In first, my first point is to, to, to address that issue. Okay. And, and I think, you know, this is what surprised me. I don't know if this lady is, is an economist or not. But, but I think let's not confuse um, quantitative easing because, you know, I, I used the, the phrase printing of money when I last spoke. And, you know, metaphorically speaking, we call it money printing. But in reality, everyone knows that there's no such thing as printing of money. The U.S. government doesn't say, OK, we're going to print three trillion dollars of money and they, they issue one pound, one dollar notes, right? That, that's ludicrous. No one's going to do that. Effectively, what it is, is they create electronic money, electronic debt from nothing. So it's on the bank's balance sheet, right? Yep. And then that money is a, a loan, which then gets spent. That's what it is. So when I use the word money printing loosely, let's not get confused. And one thing is quantitative easing. And that quite another thing is running budget deficits. So quantitative easing, in essence, and to some extent, she's right. When you print money, and this is, but she gets confused as well. When you print money, or, where, or, or when you create debt, right? Um, you're right that that governments can, in in essence, can continue printing money and increasing the monetary base, the money supply in the system. That is absolutely correct. And that is not debt. That is just that they increase the amount of money in circulation, right? That is quantitative easing. Now, quantitative easing, essentially what it is, it's used for yield curve control. So what the Federal Reserve, let me use one central bank. What the Federal Reserve does is it, 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 it creates money supply, yeah? It creates electronic money. That money is then used by the central bank to buy its own treasury bonds, right? And, and they are substituting cash for holding their own treasury bonds. By, hold, by buying treasury bonds, it reduces the yield down, the, 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 the control to the curve. So we want zero interest rates, right? That's all they're doing. And it's true. They can continue creating money to infinity yes. for yield curve control. That's one thing. But the second thing is, separately to quantitative easing, and this is very important to understand. Governments are running fiscal deficits because the revenue that, is, that, that the government is generating through taxation is not enough to cover the running of the, of the government, yeah? the expenditure. Yep. So the running government deficits, those have to be repaid in the same way that if you, if you borrow money and you use your credit card to the hilt, you have to pay that. Mm -hmm. Two separate things, quantitative easing, and fiscal deficits. And fiscal deficits require funding from the issuance of treasury bonds, because look, you, 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 you run deficits, but that def deficit has to be funded by someone, yeah? So look at the US government, what do they do? They issue treasury bonds and they try and sell it out in the market. And then there's buyers who buy the treasury bond and fund the government, right? So that is, um, that is, in essence, the difference between quantitative easing and, and fiscal deficits. Now, let me say one thing. What we're seeing now in the US, again, I refer to the US, in the month of March, we're having the highest uh, issuance of new treasury bonds ever recorded in history. 372 billion of debt has been issued in, in the month of March alone, 372 billion. I've got the graphs here and it's just, and that is the growing mountain of debt. The Senate and the House of Representatives have just approved a $2 trillion package. There's another $2 trillion to be approved for clean energy. 
initiatives, green energy, sorry, for infrastructure and clean energy, yes. but 372 billion. Now, the thing to understand is when the government is, uh, um, issues 372 billion uh, of, of treasury bonds for, to, to fund the debts, yeah, the fiscal imbalance, someone has to buy it. Right now, the buyer of last resort is the Federal Reserve because there's no buyers in the market, right? Mm -hmm. And interestingly, in the month of March, only the Fed could only buy because they didn't have more capacity, 23% of the issue, causing a, a, a mismatch between issuance, supply, and demand, which is why we've seen the yield curve going high in the US. Because if you keep, you know, issuing, creating debt and no one is buying it, it pushes the yield higher rather than lower, which is what they're trying to achieve. Now, those of you who still believe in modern monetary theory should read the book by Yanis Varoufakis, Adults in the Room. Yeah. And I hope, I hope all of us are adults in the room. Listen, this guy <laughs> is, is the economist par excellence, the best guy. He led the negotiations with the EU when Greece were effectively defaulted on their debt. And he's an amazing um, economist and, 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 you know, has shed some light into, into this issue about, you know, debt creation and so on. But let me go on to, to address Kate's points and I'll try to be as succinct as I, as I possibly can. Um, and let me add, the reason you're doing this is this is setting a very big picture context for the whole conversation we're having, right? This affects Absolutely. as much as we might not want to take on these big ideas. This is an important contextual discussion. And, and just very quickly, that isn't a devil's fork in behind Sally. It is a lamp for those who <laughs> had become concerned about that. So go on, Paul. So, so in theory, you know, um, you know, quantitative easing is not limitless. And... Um, and doesn't increase the debt burden, fiscal deficits do, as I've just explained, but there's a lack of empirical evidence to support Kate's um, thesis that MMT is inflationary. In fact, the, since the global financial crisis in 2008, despite unprecedented and continuous uh, con quantitative easing, there has been no inflation whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we're fighting a deflationary war. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we won't experience inflation in the next 12 months. We might, but there's another reason for that, that we might experience inflation, and I'll address that a bit later on. Um, but I think a money-centric view of the economy ignores our economic system's foundation, which, say, which states, you know, that there's three things to, um, to the economy. Um, you know, everyone thinks that the money supply, an increase in the money supply leads to uh, an increase in inflation. Um, but that is not entirely correct because there's three parts to, to this equation. There's, there's the economic output of the country, which is called GDP, gross domestic product. There's the monetary base, which is the money supply, right? And then there's the velocity of money, which is the speed at which money changes hands. So, GDP, global uh, economic output of a country, say the US, equals money supply multiplied by the velocity of money. Now, the reason why we haven't seen economic growth is because despite pumping more money into the system, which is money supply, mm. the velocity of money, the speed at which money changes hands has been falling. Yes. Right? So the output has remained the same. So increasing the money supply has had no impact whatsoever in, 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 in driving growth. Now, um, le let me explain why we, um, we might see some inflation rearing its ugly head. Um, and it's not due just to the money supply. I think there's been pent up demand um, during this pandemic. Uh, there's been changes in consumer spending patterns. Uh, because people are spending more on electronics and, and home goods rather than on sp spending out. There's been disruptions to the supply chains, and all this has had an inflationary impact uh, because, you know, a lot of um, companies were, weren't expecting such a 
huge spike in demand, right? And they were running down the inventories, but they didn't have the capacity to to build up the inventories again. So that caused a sharp rise in, in raw materials and commodity prices. So the question is whether this is a lockdown-induced um, spike in inflation and transitory, or whether it's, it's, it's one to stay with us for a longer time. Uh, but I hope, you know, I will demystify mm. now, you know, the, the, the issue of, you know, MMT and so on. Um, oh, we've got some music from somebody. Uh, exactly. If everybody could mute up, that would be awesome. As nice as that was. I think, you know, I think what, what Kate is alluding to is the, the assumption that increases in the broad uh, money supply would le leads to inflation. Uh, and I think she mentions um, money chasing the same number of goods equals inflation. And I would dispute that. I think our monetary system is much more complex than that. And, um, and, uh, and it needs explaining. Let me let me explain. Look, the factors of production are, <clears throat> are, are um, land, people, and capital, and then to that you can add technology. So let me give you a very simple. You've got the the factors of production, right? And let me give you a very simple uh, explanation. So this 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 entrepreneur has ten acres of land. Yeah and employs 10 people and has a uh, certain machinery to, to, for the harvest, yeah? So, so they employ a fixed number of people, they've got machinery, and they've got, you know, 10 acres of land. Now they decide to acquire more land, and then now they have 200 acres of land, right? So they overstimulate one of the factors of production, which is land but they don't use the capital to buy machinery and they don't employ more people for the harvest, right? All they do is they increase the land and they expect to produce more with the same people and the same machinery. What do you think um, will happen to, um, to, um, to productivity? Carl, what do you think will happen to productivity? It will go down. It will go down. Yeah. And this is the same. We are overstimulating one of the factors of production, which is capital and pumping money. But without, you know, a, a, a rise in, in, in capital investment and people in employment, it has very little bearing on, on economic growth. So, you know, the, the proponents of modern monetary theory and think that, you know, just increasing the monetary base is this m magical bullet that saves us all are deluded, if I'm very honest. And sorry for the language I use, but but there's no evidence to support that 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 does anything. I will agree that it has saved the global economy yes. from a from something similar to the global financial crisis, yes. which where they opted for austerity, which was the biggest mistake they ever made. I, I completely agree with that. And this time round, they have okay, they have overstimulated the economy. I don't. I think they have left a mountain of debt which needs to be recovered through taxation. I don't know how Kate or anyone else thinks that tax, uh, there's no need to tax people to recover that debt. That debt has to be repaid somehow. And there's different ways of dwindling down the debt. And I think I've touched upon it before. This debt overhang, the ways to do it is austerity and higher taxes, which would result in a deep recession. We can grow our way out of the debt through strong economic growth. Uh, which I think is going to be difficult because of this debt overhang, which is a drag on growth. We could create an inflationary environment, which is, I think, what the authorities are trying to do, <laughs> reduce the real value of the debt. Or fourthly, the fourth option, which I've mentioned before, Carl, is restructuring the debt in an orderly manner through, um, through um, um, uh, I use the word was, um, how do you call that, a... Um, through um, uh, haircuts, through debt haircuts, yes, yeah? Haircuts, the haircuts that uh, Yana, uh, Avaris, uh, Yanis exactly. Avaris mentions, yes. Exactly, the haircuts that Yanis uh, mentions. Um, so... Well, that's a very strong rebuttal, and it sets uh, the scene for, for, for our discussion this evening. Sorry, have I cut you off too soon? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say um, 
that velocity of money has been in steep decline for many years now due to, to, to dem, due to demographic demographics the growing mountain of debt and weak investment prospects yes so the velocity of money has been in decline and one other point that I would like to say is that you know there's something called the output cap now the output output cap is an economic measure of the difference between the actual output of an economy and the potential output if it was running um, at its most efficient. And there's a huge output, output cap right now. And the question most economists are asking themselves is whether, you know, as we get a transition out of, uh, out of lockdown, whether that output cap can be reduced, in which case, potentially, it could be inflationary. Now, there's something else which um, is worth covering in terms of, of um, um, yeah, in, in terms of, you know, um, the, um, yeah, in terms of, you know, the theory of MMT and so, and so forth, which, which I think would, would interest uh, yeah, the, the audience. Um, everyone seems to think, you know, this quantitative easing and, and you know, how, how it works and, and why it would stimulate the economy. Look, the reality, I'm going to try to be as succinct as I possibly can. The reality is that um, the reason why all this money supply has had very little impact on the recovery so far, uh, ad admittedly, it has managed to keep us afloat, yes. is because the money hasn't, f hasn't um, flowed into the real economy. Mm -hmm. the, f the money has flowed into the, real into, the, um, into the stock market. Look, let me explain how it all works. So you create money, right? The Federal Reserve engages in, in quantitative easing. So it takes a bond from the private sector, the primary dealers in the market, and they hold treasury bonds. The, the banks, the, the central banks will, will effectively create money through quantitative easing. They use the money. They say to the primary dealer, here's the money. I'm going to buy treasury bonds to depress the yield, right? That's what they do. The money then goes into the, into the accounts of primary dealers in, with, with, um, with, with banks. So that increases the bank balance sheet. So there's more money. But look, one thing, a lot of the banks are hesitant to lend in times of economic strife and uncertainty. So yeah. the money sits in the, in, in the bank's balance sheet, but there's no extending of credit. So it has no impact in the real economy, one. And two, that a lot of the money that has been, you know, all this helicopter money that is being given freely, you know, people are not in uh, there's no consumer spending. People are just holding the money and deciding, oh, this is free money. What do I do? I put it in the stock in the stock market. And until and unless we see money flowing out of the stock market, which is overvalued, into the real economy and into spending, you know, then I'm afraid that quantitative easing on its own won't have any, any impact. Now, do I see inflation down the road, medium term? Yes, I see, you know, raw materials um, and commodity prices being... Uh, and uh, uh, increasing in price because there's going to be a supply shortage. I think eventually money will flow out of stock markets into the real economy when the lockdown ends. And that could, and we could well see a transitory effect on inflation. Um, but you know, the, this notion that um, MMT resolves all problems through, uh, through debt creation and there's no taxation listen, fantastic. If it were true, it would be brilliant. Right. But, you know, I think the real world doesn't work like that. And, and the monetary system is much more complex than Kate thinks in terms of how money flows uh, through the economy. Um, and, and, you know, I've got graphs here and I've got other examples I can give. It's a strong yeah. defense. No, we t we, I think we get it, Paul. And, and one quest great question that's, that's come up in your, in your um, attack on, uh, you know, monetary theory there, modern monetary theory, is, is there any good news? Because that, that, would, that would appear um, to be the, the death knell to that theory, as, as you've put it. But all is not lost, right? Because you, it does sound like you're creating a bit of a grim um, economic picture, financial picture. No, no. Well, well there's, two, there's two things here. I, I, I'm, 
I think that the measures they took in the, during the global financial crisis of austerity were completely uh, mistaken. Yeah. The worst thing you can do in a, in a recession is to, um, is to cut back on government spending. That, that is just absolute madness. Yes. I think they found out a bit too late, I, I, probably a year or two into the global financial crisis, that their economic policy uh, response was completely wrong. It was slow and it was the, the wrong policy mix of fiscal and monetary policy. Uh -huh. So I think there's, and I think governments have learned the lesson of the global financial crisis and adopted a different approach, which was, we will throw the kitchen sink at the problem and make sure we keep the economy ticking. Yes. We keep, we avoid uh, businesses from closing down. Yes. And when the economy bounces back, we can increase taxation to recover some of the debt. Yes. I think it's, is probably a something that is not desirable, but but it was it was the right medicine at the right time. Now, my concern is not now. I think I think now I think the economies will rebound very quickly as lockdowns end, inevitably. I think there's there's in the UK alone there's 200 billion of extra saving during the, the past 12 months. 200 billion people have been hoarding cash and saving money because they've been at home, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of pent-up demand. And you know, when, when the, the global economy opens up to travel, there's going to be a lot of spending and there's going to be a very strong global economic recovery. Uh, pandemic allowing, you know, and, you yes. know, herd immunity and so on. So there's going to be a strong recovery. Now, the question is not the strong recovery. The question is that that debt has to be repaid and the economy is not strong enough and resilient enough to sustain this recovery without further injections of uh, of uh, infrastructure spending and more fiscal spending and more quantitative easing and more debt. It needs further injections. We've become junkies. We depend on that debt. Since 2008, we've been borrowing more and doing more quantitative easing to keep our heads above the parapet. Because basically, you know, when you're running with too much debt, that is a drag on future growth. And the only way to address this issue, I gave four, example, four ways of doing it. And if it's through taxation, you know, taxation and, and stock markets don't go well together because higher corporate taxes means lower EBITDA, lower profits for companies. And there's a stock market re, uh, readjustment to take into account that companies drive left, less profit. So do you think it's the, the right thing to do? Probably. Um, will it have consequences further down the road? Absolutely. I think we are set for a period of sub-standard uh, growth uh, or sub-growth. Uh, you know, we're not going to get 3% economic growth over the next 10 years. We're going to have much lower rates of economic growth. That's my honest opinion. Fair enough. Uh, the question is persisting. What is the good news? And I can see we have some amazingly uh, financially uh, literate people in our audience tonight who have questions for you. Uh, but we must address um, the um, financial planning for British expats, which some people have turned up for <clears throat> here tonight. And that was a sexy and spicy start, I have to say, um, putting, putting the picture straight as you see it. And we will return to your uh, investment ideas, tips and predictions. And that presumably, Paul, is where the good news lives, is in, is in how the people here, how individuals can invest in the right way to weather the, the storm and, and, and the limited growth you see coming. For example, maybe investing in those raw materials that are needed right now. As the uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. I think, you know, surprisingly enough, you know, this, this economic recession was event driven. It wasn't a structural recession. Yeah. It wasn't a cyclical recession. Uh -huh. It was event driven by the pandemic. I think there's a strong rebound. But there's going to be scars in certain sectors of the economy. Some will rebound strongly, others will struggle. Uh, and, and, you know, we've seen stock markets, that there's a mispricing of assets. You know, we, we've got the tech sector, which is overpriced. There's other sectors which are uh, very, very expensive. And it's a question of finding pockets of value in the stock market, you know. And there are pockets of value, and Good. you're right. And you'll you be know, pointing your finger at those after you've uh, done the financial planning for British expats bit. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I will put my head above the parapet and you can shoot me if my predictions turn out to be 
uh, completely wrong. We look forward, uh, to it. and, and, and people not shooting you, but we look forward to your tips, is what I'm saying. Um, and, and also more talk about, um, you know, how Yanis Varoufakis and uh, the, the lessons hopefully learned from from the, from austerity and, and and the financial crisis of 2008. But so yes, so let's take a sort of a little let's let's lower the um, pace and 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 go into your your specialism that you're talking about here tonight. For our American viewers and listeners, um, Paul tends to specialise in, in in British expats, but I think can can connect with you and point you in the right direction um, if you have similar issues as an expat from anywhere in the world. But this is as, as built specifically. The things that British expats should know about when it comes to their financial planning, Paul. I think what we're seeing now, a topical issue, um, and I hope it resonates with some of the um, some of the viewers today who have tuned in, um, is that you know the post Brexit phenomenon of Brits who have been living in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain and Portugal below the radar, uh, keeping their heads. Um, below the parapet, but spending over 183 days and technically triggering residency, but without uh, formally establishing tax residency in, in, in those countries. I think what I'm finding in, in my practice um, is that, that you know, post-Brexit, a lot of Brits now want to formalize their tax position because the, the law, the rules have changed. Okay. When we were, as Brits, when we were part of the EU, we could live, work and study within the European Union, no question asked. You could spend, you know, more than 183 days and register for tax purposes, yeah? Some opted to spend more than 183 days and keep their heads below water. Others played by the, by the, by the rules and, and they spend less than 180 days but they spend it consecutively. And one of the rule changes for, for, um, for, for British experts is being a third country now, yeah. they can only spend 90 days every 180 days, right? Rather than 170 days consecutively. And I think that is called, that, that is, there's, there's some pain points there. Yes. A lot of them are saying, okay, right, what do we do? Do we formalize our situation in Spain, which they should, or Portugal for that matter, or do we just um, limit the number of days we spend, but we will still want to spend more than 90 days every 180 days, and then what do we do? And of course, the, the solution for, 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 for Spain, for instance, is, is the golden visa and the non-lucrative visa. And, and in Portugal, it's the golden visa, which is the same scheme, just in another in Portugal. And, and the equivalent of the non-lucrative visa is the D7 visa. Yes. Right. And that gives you the, the, the right to spend up to 180 days without necessarily then going for NHR or whatever. So this is what I'm finding. That, and I think you, you cannot build a house. The foundations have to be solid, right? What you can't build is the build a house with shaky foundations. Mm -hmm. And the essence of good financial planning is to make sure that the your tax planning, your tax residency, your investments, everything is aligned to the country where you're tax resident. But the key news there, the red, the red flag, red light, the warning light coming on, on the dashboard financially is that whereas before Brexit, it was a little bit easier for people to be in the grey areas and the long grass, that is not a luxury people have anymore. It's not a luxury, absolutely not. It never I was mean, technically, but I mean, it's a real problem now. It's an absolute real problem. And I think, you know, I get inquiries, loads of inquiries co constantly. And, you know, the question is the same. You know, at least in respect of, I've had a few inquiries from Portugal wanting to move to Gibraltar, you know. I've had a few inquiries from Spain and they're asking the question, you know, how fluid is the border? You know, Gibraltar has a double taxation agreement with Spain now. You know, there's no, there's no way to get around this. You have to do things properly. Yes. And in fact, we had, I had, um, um, I, I sought clarity from the Commission of Income Tax in Gibraltar regarding this double taxation agreement, which doesn't affect you guys living in Portugal, regarding the double taxation agreement with Spain uh, and how it comes into force. I'm not going to go into the detail, but I can envisage that maybe 
you know, that, that these double taxation agreements and common reporting standards, you know, they are very, um, the, the, you know, the information is, is being exchanged freely between tax authorities. Okay. Wherever you live, you know, there's no way you can continue being um, pretending to be resident in, in a country where you're not. Yes, you really like have to, to formalize your tax residency and then plan accordingly. Because look, look, whether you live in Spain, Portugal or Greece or whatever, the reality is there's tax planning opportunities as an expert to limit your taxation quite considerably. And sometimes you're surprised, you know, that the opportunities, in essence, you can pay less tax than you would in the UK. It's a question of, of how, do, you know, you can skin a cat in different ways, right? It's just understanding what the rules are and playing by the rules. Yes, but the key message is to face it and deal with it now. Absolutely. Look, I'll give you an example in, yes. in, in, in Portugal. Um, you have non-habitual residency regime, which until very recently, I think the end of 2020, you paid 0% tax on pension income. The rules have now changed. Mm -hmm. And we again, we've sought uh, legal advice in Portugal just last week. The rules have changed, and now you pay ten percent. Ten now, yeah, absolutely. Ten percent on pension income. But what they, do, what a lot of people don't know, is something called uh, renta vitalicia, which is eff eff effectively an annuity. And annuities in in Portugal are taxed very efficiently. You only pay ten percent on fifteen percent of the annuity. So any pension income you draw from a curops. You can disguise and and the trustees of the Europe's pension scheme can issue a certificate saying that it's drawn as an annuity, and you only pay you only pay ten percent on fifteen percent of the pension income. Mm -hmm. So your effective tax rate is only one and a half. So you know everyone thinks, oh, it's ten. No, actually, it could be as low as one and a half. Okay, and, and it's a question of understanding these nuances which can reduce your tax quite significantly. Right. Okay. So head out the sand and uh, take it to, to, to an expert such as Paul to find out what is possible. Are you going to go into those, um, those acronyms for us tonight, Paul, with the cure ops and, and so on? Really? I thought people were sick to... to, to, sick right. to I, I, I think there may be people who haven't heard of that. And that is part of your, your special Fine. Career. Fine. I mean, cure ops are qualifying recognized overseas pension schemes. They came into force in April 2006 following a, a change to UK law, um, which had now allowed uh, UK pension transfers to be uh, effectively moved overseas into an overseas pension scheme. Still, you know, QROPs have to be, uh, schemes have to be approved by HMRC to be legal and, you know, valid schemes. But they allow you, they offer a lot of, advantages, including um, paying a very low tax on pension income. If you're subject to lifetime allowance limits in, in, in the UK, it's a way of circumventing lifetime allowance. Right now, I think it's a million seventy three thousand. Anything above that, you crystallize a benefit unless you bought protection. It's very complex. It allows you to uh, diversify your portfolio because if you're, say, resident in the EU, you don't want to you have your pension assets in sterling because you are then subject to um, exchange rate risk, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, yeah, there's many, many advantages to having a, your pensions transferred overseas. Uh, even, you know, seamless transition to your beneficiaries. Um, they, they are, yeah, they are removed from your UK estate for inheritance tax. And even though, Pensions in the UK are not subject to inheritance tax. Uh, after age 75, you know, you pay tax. The beneficiaries will pay tax on any income. they If they didn't take the lump sum on any income they drew, the same rules apply if you have a Curops, but, but it could be much more tax effective than the UK. So it's a question of tax effectiveness, you know, tax now, planning. Taking a good look at it. Taking a good look and how, how do you make your income stretch a bit more in retirement right um at least your assistant at least i'm sure will put your um contact details in the comments if you wouldn't mind doing that at least that'd be fantastic and to obviously let uh, paul and Elise know um how you heard about uh, paul when you give him a buzz and talk through these issues anything else any headlines for british expats that no they i i, I the, the, the other 
yeah, the other headline I would say is is the importance of cash flow forecasting and modeling, because you know people think that a million pounds is a lot of money these days, and when you factor in taxation, inflation, um, investment returns, and a challenging challenging macroeconomic climate, you really have to put those variables into a into a system that can then determine when your your pension savings and investments will um, effect- effectively will run when the pot will run dry right yeah. and what people don't understand is that you know life expectancy is increasing if you were born for instance in 1967 your life expectancy you have a 50 percent probability of living to the uh, ripe old age i think of 94 Wow. If you were born in 1957, you have a 50% probability of living to the ripe old age of 92. Life expectancy is increasing at a phenomenal rate. Um, and you have to plan for a long, um, hopefully he- healthy yeah. rec- and a long life and a healthy yeah. retirement. And, you know, cash flow modeling and forecasting is so, so important. People sometimes don't realize how quickly they can... Uh, run their investments dry. So um, your old-fashioned idea then, um, when we were kids, Paul, that you, had, you were a millionaire and you had a nice Rolls Royce, that that has changed drastically. There are a few crestfallen millionaires possibly in our audience tonight. You, you're going to have to go way beyond that. Absolutely. <laughs> Especially if you're going to live to 94. Absolutely. And what we do is we, we run simulations with different variables, economic variables, yeah. different parameters, uh, and we can determine based on those parameters what, what the worst case is when your money runs dry, maybe in 20 years, best case, sorry, uh, best case, maybe 30 years, and the base case, maybe 30 years. Mm-hmm. And then it determines, yeah, should I retire now or should I keep on working until I'm 65, right? Yes. Because some people retire at 55 thinking they've done it. Uh, and some some have, right? They've, they've been very successful in business and they're fine. But yeah. not everyone is in the same boat. There's a few heads shaking in, in, in the audience tonight. No, <laughs> sorry, I, I I don't want to be the devil's advocate and to disappoint anyone, but I have to be. Hey, yes, I have, yes. To, I have to say it as it is, right? Yes. Um, okay. At this rate, I'm going to keep working until I drop dead. Oh, come on, Margarita. We're going to talk about investment in in, in just a moment. There. Uh, there was a question about what about the UK uh, HMRC taking 25 percent of the pension when moving abroad? Is that a thing? It, 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 do you mean if if that is still applicable? Yeah, is that what happens? No, no. What I mentioned last time is that that could happen. Yes. Um, that could happen moving uh, forward because, you know, uh, basically the um, um, the UK was subject to EU law. Mm-hmm. And EU law, you have the four freedoms, you know, the freedom of movement of people, the freedom of movement of capital. Mm-hmm. And under the freedom of movement of capital, the UK imposed this 25% overseas tax charge for individuals who were not, who were resident in other countries, but not the EU, because they would have been in breach of EU law. Now, having now exited the EU, they could now decide to extend that overseas tax charge to include the EU, because you know, they are no longer subject to uh, the freedom of movement of, of capital. Mm-hmm. So that, that is a distinct possibility. They haven't done it yet. They haven't done it yet, but that doesn't mean they won't do it. And you want to be one step ahead of that. Okay. Um, Colin asked, does, does Portugal have QROPs? Can you do Portugal? Uh, can you do QROPs in, in Portugal? Because um, Colin was told they had to go to Malta to do that. Yeah, you, look, you can do it in Malta because Malta has a double taxation treaty with... Um, with Portugal, um, uh, and and so the answer to that question is yes. I think Gibraltar is a better option. You pay a bit more tax. You pay two and a half, and I'm just waiting for a legal opinion, which I'll get in July, because with the changes to NHR, um, they haven't really tested um, how it will work in practice and whether the taxation of pension income from a Gibraltar Europe's, which is at two and a half, which is marginal, Mm -hmm. whether they give you that tax credit in Portugal. And I'm just waiting for clarity. But the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. You can do it and it works very tax efficiently. 
and to start the conversation. Okay, um, this has got very interesting now. Kate Gimblet has joined us tonight, uh, your, your e economics nemesis, um, it might appear. Um, and I think we, we, I imagine both of you will be up for having um, a conversation on the morning show sometimes. Now is not the time for that. Why, uh, why, why don't we do it for next week? I'm happy to... to okay, um... Kate, I don't know if you were here right at the beginning, but um, uh, from your comment that you left on, on our previous um, um, interview with Paul, um, Paul addressed that earlier on tonight. Um, I, I, I'm guessing you weren't here for that, otherwise you would have probably addressed it by now. So let's let's move that to a different setup um, because tonight we're all about the uh, financial planning for British expats and of course the investment ideas, tips and predictions that you're going to offer us, Paul, um, which we, unless there is anything else to say specifically to the British expats, you know, the headlines, what else should they be aware of? No, I think, you know, you know, the good good, good rules, you know, Establish tax residence in the country and make sure your, everything is done above board. The tax planning and, and make sure the tax planning is structured from a wealth planning perspective is done proper, properly, including succession planning. Yeah. Um, so the tax planning, succession planning, good investment portfolio, uh, and then cash flow modeling uh, and focusing. I think those are four important um, things to consider and things to do. Yes. Okay. Um, is there an equivalent to the ISA in Portugal for, for investors? Well, the the equivalent to the ISA is not really um, uh, it's not really an ISA, but I would say there's an equivalent to the UK bond, which is the Portuguese bond, which is really tax efficient, mm -hmm. and something I can cover in another webinar because it's yeah, it's an interesting concept and it's very tax efficient. All right, some great questions coming in now uh, bef before we move on to that investment portfolio. Um, what are the tax implications if income is earned in Jersey, the, in the Channel Islands? I would have to look at that. I can't tell you. I, I don't think, I'm not sure that Jersey has an agreement with Portugal, but unless I look at that, and I'm happy if you send them afterwards, I can then answer your questions uh, um, at, the, at the radio show. Yeah, okay, excellent. All right. Because they are very specific and they are specific territories and I can't cover every eventuality. Or book a call with, with Paul. Um, yeah, that's fine as well, yeah. One there. Okay, I mean, this isn't exactly a question. And I, when I first looked at it, I thought, I'm not going to read that out. But actually, I am, because uh, I want to hear your view on this. Uh, Margarita says, can we give a large round of applause or ammunition to all those who voted leave? And obviously, she's referring to Brexit. Um, are you seeing any upside um, I'm obviously, this is you know, it has rendered the, the, the Brits um, a third country of origin now. They have a whole load of uh, hassle and difficulties to face as a result of this. But is is there long term a financial upside to this? Oh, I think there is. Look, I'm, I, I was I I I voted to remain, but but we, we but was very skeptical skeptical about the EU. I I still am because mm. I think it's a failed economic project. And then during the Brexit negotiations. I become very anti-EU because I think, frankly, the way they have reacted has been, you know, extremely childish. We've just seen it with the vaccines. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, they've reacted, they're, they're throwing the toys out of the pram when in fact they should, you know, the, the Brits, the Israelis, the Americans, the, the United Arab Emirates, they, they took the risk of funding the research for a vaccine. And then they had the right to have the supply of the vaccines, as simple as that. And they were very quick off the blocks. If the EU, due to their incompetence and the bureaucracy, uh, weren't nimble and fast enough, then that's their problem. And they're throwing the toes, toys out of the pram. But going back to your question, uh, Carl, do I see? A, do I see? I tend to digress. Do I see an upside? Absolutely. And funnily enough, I was speaking to a client just before the, two hours before the show. And and he thought, oh, Britain is is in perpetual decline. I don't think that's that is necessarily uh, true. I think Britain neglected the Commonwealth when they joined the EU, and what you're seeing now is that they're re-engaging with a lot of the Commonwealth countries and signing trade agreements. They've increased their presence in Africa because they see that it's a continent which offers great potential. You know, their trade agreements with Australia, Canada, and I think what they'll do is they will, there will be some pain in the, in, in the short term, but I think, you know, Britain is an, a country with a, a deep entrepreneurial spirit, and I think the benefits of leaving the EU will, will take some time to, it's like, um, yeah, 
it's like uh, planting a seed, right? Yes. The fruits will take some time. Uh, uh, the fruits of the le- of, of planting that seeds will 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 in time uh, pay dividends, but it's not going to be immediate. Yes, well, that's, yes, uh, Colin. In our lifetime, <laughs> it's, it's a good good uh, question there. 20- I, I I believe so. I I think within five years, I think Britain will be firing on all cylinders. I've, I think we will have the, the UK economy will be very strong. How long very was that? Did you say five years? I think in five years you'll have the UK. Uh, look, listen. I've spoken to a lot of. Uh, no, I've spoken to a lot of individuals who thought that the UK economy would collapse completely. Yes. On leaving the EU, okay, on the first of January. Yeah. And notwithstanding that we've not just left the EU, but we've got the pandemic, the UK economy is in a stronger footing than the EU. Well, who'd have thought it? And and what about the bounce of the pound as well? Is that, is that another marker that we could look? Well, it's another marker because you know the pound was completely undervalued yeah. because they had priced it in worst case scenario, no trade agreement. The economy is going to collapse, and I think reality has been somewhat different. They signed the trade agreement, which is not perfect by any means, provided some stability. It gives us some breathing space to 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 to, to uh, explore other avenues for growth. And as I said, there might be a bit of pain, but but no, I, I'm not so skeptical about uh, about the long term uh, outlook. I think short to medium term, there's for sure there's going to be pain. Okay, right, uh, fascinating, absolutely. And thank you, everybody, uh, for your comments, including as a Brexiteer, I applaud you, Paul, for your comments. Leaving the EU is not about money for many of us. Independence has come at short-term cost, but we know that we can work through that. The EU GDP has been declining for some years now, so Jeff, at least in agreement with you. Um, and we know that's a bit of a contentious subject. So probably best kept to our um, morning show. Very happy to handle these sorts of issues on the Good Morning Portugal show every weekday morning. And it would be great to see you and Kate on the same screen at some point. Um, for those who, who are a little bit rocked by having reached uh, millionaire status, but then suddenly realising they might live to 94 and they better put some money into investments. Let's talk about that now, Paul. And uh, before you talked to me about precious metals and you talked to me about industrial metals, didn't you? And I went and put in an ex- exploratory experimental investment on my Revolut card in a gold mining company and in some gold and some silver. And it has been a fair favorable response after a little bit of a dip just like you were talking about with with um brexit there a little bit of a dip at first but looking very favorable subsequently no i think i think you're right there has been a dip in the price of of precious metals gold and silver and they, that has been predominantly can you hear me yeah yeah we got well, you yeah. yeah we got you. it's pre- predominantly due to the fact that that a lot of you know in times of economic strife and uncertainty when there's a, ma- a huge amounts of debt uh, when interest rates, you know, but basically the debasement of the fiat currencies, um, growing mountain of debt, um, all those things tend to, um, people will move the assets into hard, hard currency, you know, into gold and silver as a safe haven. And that hasn't really materialized. I think we've seen a dip in the price of gold and silver, but what we're seeing is a, a, a phenomenon Generation Y generation said that they are, um, uh, you know, a lot of that money that would traditionally have flown into, uh, f- flowed into gold has gone into, into Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Yes, that's true. Uh, the, the, that, that is that is the main issue. But I still think, honestly, I think, uh, you know, we will see um, the price of gold uh, uh, doubling. Uh, and I think it'll break through 2000. I think by the end of the year, maybe a realistic target is anywhere between 2100 and 2300. And um, and then it will surge past $3,000. I love it when you talk precious metals. And I have to say at this point, um, this is not advice, anybody. We're not giving out advice. This is Paul being bold um, about his uh, one of his uh, areas of expertise and, and sharing uh, with us bold I said there Colin um, about <laughs> about um, what he thinks could happen so you know take it or leave it but I think Paul's being um, uh, typically um, open and, and adventurous and honest about what he sees happening um, in the markets and if I go back br- just briefly there to your tip that you gave before um, I have to give myself a little bit of credit here because um, one particular pick you went for was the Kinross Gold Corporation you would yes. say invest in mining obviously if gold's going to go up 
gold mining might uh, suffer a, a similar uh, a fate, a positive fate. Um, Kinross did go up, um, up 11%, uh, just, to, just to report back factually on your tip. But mine did even better, Paul. I, oh. I went for Harmony gold mining, and that's gone up 20%. And you did tell me, yeah. yeah. So my ten dollars has gone up to a whopping twelve, twelve dollars and six. Before anybody gets the wrong idea here, um, but it's it's a, it's a very interesting ex experiment. Uh, commodities dipped a little bit, so my twenty uh, twenty pounds total investment is down to eighteen eighty one. But I think, as you say, that's a longer term thing, isn't it? With precious metals, you've got to be in it for the long term with those. You right? have to be in the game for the long term. You know, good investments rarely produce returns over the short term that's speculation yes. you, you have to take uh, you know decisions based on on value yeah and and as i alluded to before um it's it's a difficult market you have to find pockets of value and you have to stick the stick it out for the long term and in the meantime there's going to be speculation in certain sectors which is going to drive uh, you know those investments higher but you have to be extremely it demands patience yeah. And it demands a long-term outlook. If you are extremely, um, if your risk tolerance is very low, then you know, stay in cash. But but if you are prepared to to take the longer-term view and endure that, the inevitable volatility that we're going to experience because these are uncertain, volatile economic times, then I think you can reap the rewards of of being patient. Well, living to 94 is quite a long term view, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned speculation there. And uh, we, we can't have one of these conversations without mentioning the cryptocurrencies. The 160 pounds that I had um, in a little savings pocket, I thought, OK, well, I'll, I'll convert that to crypto. And my 160 pounds is now worth it, it's just gone up a few pence. Uh, 100, this is real time crypto updating went from 160 to, to its current value of 188.63. Again, I'm not giving people advice. I'm just, we're looking at the world of investments here. And yeah. I know you have a particular view of the crypto, don't you? Well, I mean, the thing is that, that crypto is becoming embraced by a lot of companies, including Tesla, who invested quite heavily in crypto. Mm. So did Wells, Wells Fargo Bank in the US. Mm. So they're embracing digital. Uh, but, you know, it's highly speculative. As were the the tulips of Amsterdam in in the 1600s, and then everywhere where everything went, um, yeah, I'm not going to use the phrase something up, yeah. Yes, I get and, it. We get it. Uh, you get it, right? So, it's so the tulips. Yeah, so so I think they've embraced. Uh, the, people are embracing uh, crypto, and maybe there's a place for it, but the speculation is just phenomenal. The money flowing into it because people are. They can see the dollar signs. And in fact, in fairness to people who've invested in crypto, they made a lot of money. But, but you know, uh, I still don't understand what the intrinsic value is. With gold, you do, right? The gold reserves, it anchors the monetary system and so on. But crypto really is pure, pure speculation. Yes. And you might look at your colleagues who did well in that, as, as some of the same colleagues in pre-dot-com who, who did well. They made their money and they got out in yeah. time. Others didn't, right? Exactly, exactly. Those who are smart, they get out, look, yes. fair dues, they've made the money, they've taken the risk, but then they're smart enough to, to, to understand when one has to exit the market and, and invest more sensibly uh, for the long term. Look, I'll give you a few because we're running out of time. Yes, give you a few well, ideas uh, because we're going to stick around to answer a few more questions, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. A few pockets of value. Look, yeah, yeah. Um, we invested in February in travel and leisure because the economy is now um, starting to open up, right? Um, slowly, but um, surely it's it's opening up to travel. Um, and I think different elements of the travel sector will, will open up at different speeds. I think hotels, airlines, casinos, and theme parks will take more time uh, before they all be, before they, uh, before the the you know we used to, before occupancy rates and revenues are, are are driven up and they start bouncing the share price that's bouncing back, but other parts of the travel and leisure business are starting to open up now, and um, we've invested you know allocated some capital to travel and leisure, which is uh, in keeping with our rotation from tech 
sectors to cyclical sectors because I think that's in the, you know industrials and materials and travel and leisure because we're going to see a a spike in an, a strong economic recovery and the opening up of economies and travel and leisure should do extremely well as we see you know it won't be a straight line uh, improvement in consumer spending uh, different elements of the consumer experience will recover at different speeds uh, but we already our investment in travel and leisure has gone up about 10 12 percent interesting in february and since february so about six weeks in and we're topping up now and increasing because you know as the economy is start opening up and as the vaccine is rolled out you know once hotels airlines and casinos and theme parks start generating more revenue i think the upside is quite significant okay. so i would say invest in travel and leisure because I think they offer amazing um, uh, long-term opportunities. Um, another sector which I'm particularly positive about is digital, uh, which is effectively using technology to solve business problems in a more intelligent way and improving the, the client experience. Uh, and, and I refer to, to uh, research out there, they say the digital transformation market is expected to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 22% over the next six years, and it will grow, you know, to um, to five trillion. Sorry, 3.2 trillion by 2025, and um, five trillion by 2030. Interesting. So let's be a bit more specific about what that might mean, because that, in a way, takes us back to crypto. The, the basis of crypto is the blockchain, isn't it? So well, well yeah, you, you could say that blockchain is, 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 is a part of it. Yeah, because bl blockchain, I think, offers uh, you it will cut the middleman and it will be um, it will be. Um, yeah. Blockchain is is the future, and you and you uh, include that in, in the digital investment. Yeah, you could say that that blockchain is 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 um, includes uh, blockchain technology. Yes. Okay. Um, and another sector which I referred to last time, which I'm going to touch upon again today, is solar and clean energy. Um, I think from you know we are moving towards zero net emissions in 2050. We've seen Biden now approve a two trillion or, or rather he by the 4th of July they'll approve a 2.3 trillion um no they they sorry they have um the infrastructure bill it, it's it, it, it yeah it, yeah 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 it, it's part of the infrastructure bill sorry the other well no it's it's this um stimulus but there's going to be an infrastructure infrastructure spending um, bill coming through late as well. So it's the two trillion and another two trillion. Yeah. But look, just in clean energy alone, um, J JP Morgan thinks that global demand for battery storage solutions will increase a hundredfold yeah. between now and 2030. Now, there's a lot of companies, prim prim primarily in Japan, but not exclusively, that specialized in this battery, battery uh, storage. And that is the future, you know, um, and a hundred hundredfold increase. You can imagine there's companies out there um, that are investing in this technology and will drive incredible returns moving forward. I haven't got, unfortunately, some of the names here, which I'm happy to do in the radio show. And, and we can talk about some of those uh, names because it's quite interesting, the amount of investment that has gone into battery storage and how it can transform, uh, you know, electrical vehicles and so on. But look, going back to solar energy. Okay, we've touched upon solar energy. Let's go to artificial intelligence because we are, we are short of, of time maybe, yeah? No, you, you're very welcome to go into that a little bit further. I, I'm just, um, I, I forget which, um, you're, you're a regular on the radio show and I'm just trying to find the exact um, day of, you're on a Wednesday. Um, with us on the radio show, which is always a lot right. of fun, uh, where you talk more about um, investment predictions. Uh, and yes, second Wednesday of every month, uh, Paul joins me live on, on the morning show, which is always good fun. So do put that date in your diary. So I'm going to very quickly, I'm going to touch up on a few other areas where there's pockets of value. Yep. One is 5G, and 5G is a wireless network which is being rolled out, which will increase internet speeds a hundredfold. And it will drive all the other technologies which I will 
shortly address. Uh, and without it, these technological in, uh, advancements cannot be possible. So 5G is the foundation rock on which all the other technologies uh, are based, you know, whether it's, you know, um, Obviously in yeah, it's the it's the, it's the it's artificial intelligence. It's autonomous vehicles, electrical vehicles. Um, it's um, it's uh, biotech and healthcare. Everything depends on this. So five G is um, I think is an area to invest in. And just to give you some some data uh, because I think it's quite interesting. Um, no, I think. Yeah, no, I think there's no need to to to, yeah. okay. to expand on that uh, further. All right, fair um, enough. We got a, we got some observations and questions, uh, and and we will conclude this section uh, in, in just a moment, and 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 give you uh, grateful thanks for your input tonight. Uh, you've worked hard. I'll, ju I'll, I'll just touch on, on one other thing, and then I'm, yeah, I'm cool. so yeah. so the other the area the other area where people should invest in for the longer term is artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence. Uh, is the use of algorithms to 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 uh, carry out highly manual and repetitive tasks, right? And um, and it's what we call augmented intelligence. But then the ne next big step is uh, making computers learn from large data sets and come up with solutions to much more difficult and complex problems. And this is what's commonly referred to as machi machine learning. Mm. And then the holy grail of artificial intelligence and it's the last and final step is deep learning, which involves layers of neural networks to solve the really complex problems. And artificial intelligence will help transform major industries. And this is anecdotal, but it just gives you an idea of the potential for investment returns. PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, did a research quite recently, and they said that artificial intelligence contributed two trillion to the global economy in 2018. And they expect it to rise to 15.7 trillion by 2030. Um, that is, uh, and then Bill Gates is predicting that it will grow to just 13 and a half trillion, mm. which is quite conservative. But then we have persistent market research, and they expect it to grow 40 fold to 25 trillion. So anywhere between 15 and 25 trillion, we're talking about you know, a multiple of, I don't know, 10, 12 times in the next 10 years. And, you know, investments that are that go in early into global deep learning, uh, artificial intelligence, investments that take, you know, that 10 year view and invest now, I think they are well set to drive, you know, incredible returns moving forward. I think that is the future of investing, really. Wow, well, okay, that's a, a bold prediction, and 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 remember maybe where you heard it first um, here on the webinar with Paul tonight. So a couple of comments: um, crypto is a minefield, and many scams out there it is not regulated. Says Colin, uh, not happy about it. However, uh, Steve balances that comment with: you just need to find good people, do good due diligence, spread risk, and not be greedy. I make my living from crypto. Uh, we might have to have a crypto group, I think, um, and I suspect Paul might turn up under a pseudonym just to keep an eye on what's going on there. If we have every, if we have a crypto club as others look, i'm sure look i was reading last night i was quite surprised that there's something called uh, who was the guy who who deals in crypto sorry again what's his oh, name steve. yeah steve steve Taylor. steve well steve will know that there's something called altcoin and i was looking at it last night though the night before and altcoin has gone up they've issued altcoin one altcoin two up to altcoin date and it's it's gone up like 800 percent in one year alone yeah. and i'm thinking <laughs> everyone's well, written that down Honestly, I mean, I don't know if Steve wants to offer any comments because I'm not, I'm not a great believer in 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 crypto. But you have to, you know, you have to say it. You know, it has gone up yes. eightfold in one year. Eightfold. Can yes. you imagine putting ten thousand in? What your investments will be worth? A lot of money. But look, it comes with risk, and you you have to be brave. Yeah. Uh, I think you can still make money in these technologies, which are real and which add value to the real economy, and you don't take uh, the same level of risk. Very interesting. So, and finally, this is something I want to put to you. Um, Jeff, for example, saying it's not sufficient rare earth material to meet battery demand. 
and the you know the hideous practice of mining some of these things do you have uh, conscientious alternatives you might call them or ethical and ethical uh, alternatives of investment do you look at that paul or is an investment an investment to you well i think i think that they call it um, environmental societal and gov governance and it's ethical investing and it's becoming more prominent right so what you find is that investment houses uh, some of them then relabel their funds as ethical funds. And I think a lot of more money will flow into solar and clean energy because they're going to be um, rebranded re as ethical investing. And I think, yes, that that's uh, much more money will flow into those. And I think clean energy in particular will benefit from that. But going back to the point about the scarcity of, you know, he, he I think this chap, touches on a very a very good point which which I want to cover it very very briefly I promise you okay. I'll go off air as quickly as I can but he's absolutely right in saying that there's a scarcity of uh, raw materials for battery storage solutions and you know electrical vehicles all this technology that we've spoken to they require a lot of nickel they require and even these batteries they require aluminium and copper and graphite and lithium and I've got some research here which says that in the next 10 years, the demand for nickel will increase 14-fold. The demand for aluminium will increase 1,400% as well. Phosphorus, 1,300%. Iron, 1,200. Copper, 1,100%. You know, on average, a lot of these, um, you know, rare metals... We'll, whether you call them rare metals or industrial metals, I think the demand is phenomenal. And I think when we talk about battery storage, you can invest in directly uh, in them through, through buying industrial metals, right? Yes. Because there's not enough demand. There's a scarcity and the demand will, will go through the roof as we transition from uh, dirty fuel to clean energy and into electrical vehicles. They demand these metals to be able to 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 uh, to run the electrical vehicles to 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 develop these um, these batteries as well. Amazing. So uh, investing in alternatives to those rare metals would obviously be a good idea as well. I yeah, I, I mean, e even interesting, even uranium, which is required for nuclear power generation, which is prevalent in France. You'll know that France. I don't know the vast most of the energy production comes through. New nuclear powered stations. I think the demand for uranium and uranium is a clean energy. It's the disposal of the of the of the uranium that is that is an issue, not not uranium itself. I think uranium is as a rare, you know, rare metal is bound to to increase as we transition into the clean energy. Okay, uh, don't buy it down the pub though, folks. And uh, no, the no. Final comment, um, I will use AI to buy Bitcoin. There's the solution. Uh, very good, Paul. Um, uh, Paul Richards, that is. Paul Correa of Fiduciary Wealth Management. You've been amazing tonight. Uh, you've given us amazing value and you, you need a little bit of a rest now, I think. So thank you very much. Before we welcome maybe a couple of questions from the floor and we stop the recording in, may I say thank you very much to you.